Hello, and welcome back to Archetype Builds. Um, it's been a long time since I posted on the channel, so this video is going to start with a little bit of a rant. If you want to skip to the content, go ahead and skip to the time code on the screen right now. Hi, I've been on a bit of a break uh, from YouTube for a little bit. Uh, not been doing super, super well at balancing all the, the other things going on in life. My work really uh, ramped up in the last month or so, um, and to couple with that, I had a lot of other things going on. D&D has picked up again. I, I actually have a campaign that's going right now. And I'm choosing not to make content about that um, just because that's like for my players and not necessarily like for you know, general consumption. So anyway, my time has been pulled in a lot of different directions and YouTube slipped through the cracks. It takes me a long time to edit these videos. So I actually filmed uh, stuff that it was in response to some of those initial like play tests that came out. But the longer the time went on, the more I realized that that surface level analysis just wasn't going to do it. So um, this video is a, a much more in-depth one. So also recently I was uh, on Reddit and I saw a thread about kind of YouTube D&D &D, uh, negativity and I weighed in because I have a channel and I wanted to talk about it and I thought I had a perspective to share. Um, and it, you know, saw some amount of traction and I got a lot of new subscribers uh, coming to the channel basically to look for a more positive and, and a more balanced perspective. So. If you are here from that Reddit thread, hi, welcome to the channel. Uh, I really hope that you like the videos that we have here uh, and, and that you kind of go through and enjoy some of my past work. The other thing that happened is that um, I got a comment from a, a rather, you know, large YouTuber, uh, Pack Tactics, um, And this was on my video about this kind of like video and response video that he and um, Chris from Tree at Monk's Temple had done about the Marshall Caster Divide. So I just wanted to say, you know, I watched Pack Tactics before I started this channel. I, it's a person that I continue to watch and continue to monitor, a very, very important voice in the optimization community and kind of a cornerstone of that optimization community on YouTube. So I genuinely do feel honored to have like received, uh, you know, a view and a comment from from uh, Pack Tactics on that discussion. Now, one thing um, I do kind of need to clarify is because a lot of the comments were about this, and to a certain extent, like a smaller extent, Pack Tactics comment was about this as well. So I wanted to address this because I, I guess I didn't make it clear in that video. I don't really consider myself to be an optimizer. Um, I certainly pay attention to. Um, the mechanics and to the numbers, and I try my best to avoid making recommendations for players that are going to result in artificially low numbers, right? I'm never going to recommend that you take a wizard with a low intelligence score, or that you, you know, take a bunch of ranged fighting styles on a melee build or something like that, right? I want that build to be cohesive mechanically so that all of the different parts are helping each other out. And that's what, that's what I strive for is um, to look at all the options and make selections, which is what optimizers do, but those selections aren't necessarily gearing towards a high number threshold. They're gearing towards what is the holistic whole I want to come out on the other side. Um, I founded this channel under the belief that there is a relationship between the mechanics, the, the literal dice rolls and the probabilities and the, the, the number increases, and the flavor and thematics of these classes. I, I believe that that is what TTRPGs are, is an attempt to create a mechanical groundwork that can at least facilitate that flavor on top. And so this channel is all about making builds that are flavor first and are, we're saying this is what we want it to, to look like and feel like and act like. How do we make the selections to get there? And that's what my build videos are about. And in that vein, the thing that I care about when it comes to the Marshall Caster Divide, because I, I believe it exists on a lot of different levels, I care about the Marshall Caster Divide in terms of fun and in terms of choice. Because spellcasters get this whole spellcasting component, in addition to class features, they get a lot more customizability and they get the ability to um, exhibit certain powers that just are locked away from marshals, right? Um, it's very hard to find some kind of supernaturally powerful character from fiction and not start wondering to yourself like, okay, well, if I reflavored this spell, 
would this, you know, kind of match up with that? Um, and that's the, the disparity that I care about. And I want what Wizards of the Coast to be paying close attention to how much player choice there is available. It doesn't, you know, there can be defaults. Maybe, you know, there are um, things that are, you can swap out at later, later levels, um, but are, you know, like locked in to start with, and then new players can just kind of ride with those. But um, the customizability and the options available and kind of the different cool stuff you could potentially build your character to do is just more limited with marshals. Um, so that's what I wanted to address. And, and a lot of people kind of jumped into that video comment to say something along the lines of silly archetype builds. You know, this is about numbers. This is about the DPR numbers. And all we are really caring about is whether or not casters do better at the damage thing, which is what marshals are supposed to be for. And I, I really wanted to broaden that discussion. So that's my, those are my thoughts on, on that subject. Uh, just wanted to do that, that channel update. And um, here's to hoping that Wizards of the Coast creates much more creative marshals in the future. It's just simply not for everybody who is attracted to being a fighter. Right. Uh, because we know from nearly a decade now of going through player feedback, there are many people who love playing fighters who have no interest in what the Battle Master does. <sighs> oh well. Speaking of new new A content with Jeremy Crawford, uh, we did get a surprise playtest this month, um, and it is about cantrips and bastions. And I'm going to leave the cantrip discussion. That discussion is robust and very interesting, but I think it, it tends to focus a little bit more in this area of numbers. And that means I would love to dive into what the heck is up with bastions. So bastions are like the new player housing, the, the Warcraft garrisons, the headquarters of your adventuring party. Um, they are these like customizable home bases for your group. And they do carry a lot of benefits that they can uh, develop over time. The ways you can customize it is to allocate space, which presumably your DM gives you when you first found your ba bastion, um, to facilities. And facilities come in two forms, basic and special. Uh, because basic is uh, kind of non-functional, it doesn't really do anything, it's a lot easier to cover. Basic facilities are just flavor. They, they literally say like, oh, there's no, you know, there's no mechanical benefit of these, but it would be fun to like say that you're meeting in the kitchen or something like that. Um, but you have to build a kitchen into your bastion. They cost in my opinion, an exorbitant amount of gold uh, and a lot of time to create and then expand those facilities. And again, given that presumably your floor space is, is like assigned to you um, and that these have no benefit whatsoever, it can feel a little bit frustrating um, that, that this kind of subsystem does not really have any, any point to it. This is criticism one of the Bastion system, basic facilities, uh, are a really underwhelming component of this document. What we're here for are special facilities. Um, and these are, you get additional facilities automatically when you um, get to certain levels, um, and you unlock new options for those facilities at certain level thresholds. Each of these special facilities can take a, a specific order when you start a bastion turn, and it's going to complete that order over seven days. Issuing an order to a facility is going to result in bastion points. You're gonna roll a die. Um, the more advanced the facility, the bigger the die that you're rolling for your bastion points. And then it's also going to uh, take seven days to complete and kind of give you whatever the output is. Let's talk about bastion points first. Bastion points are pretty neat. For each special facility, right, you're having a die, you roll that die when you issue an order, and then you are accumulating bastion points that way. The highest die, I believe, is a d10, um, and the lowest is a d4. So depending on... Um, how many you know special facilities you have like that, that depends on level you're going to be generating somewhere in the ballpark of 5 to 15 bastion points each turn uh, there's only a couple functions for these bastion points um, you can either use them to increase your reputation which gives you advantage on charisma checks in a certain radius around your bastion which is very cool you can use them to 
create your own magic items and they are priced by rarity. So within a certain rarity, there's no difference on spending X number of Bastion points on a, a rare magic item, different books or, or different settings or anything like that. There's no restrictions that are listed. So you just create magic items with Bastion points. The lastly, you can spend a big old chunk of Bastion points to revive a fallen ally in the Bastion. So if they fail their three death saving throws, if they are dead, 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 and you don't have revivify or anything, you can shell out 100 Bastion points to bring that person back. But that's just kind of the tip of the iceberg on the benefits that these facilities can offer. So you can issue uh, orders like Craft, Recruit, Empower, and others. There's no real mechanical difference to these. It's not like Craft has something unique about it that is different from Empower. It's just that certain facilities can produce effects that seem like crafting or seem like empowering and so you're just going to issue whatever order that facility takes. That kind of leaves a big hole which is what are these special facilities and what can they do? So there are a lot of them and I won't be able to talk about all of them but um, at level five which is the first when you're uh, you know, you know, hypothetically unlocking your bastion you're going to get access to the arcane study, the armory, the barracks, the garden, the library, the sanctuary, the smithy, and the storehouse. This is definitely a weak starting list, which is not necessarily wrong, but um, most of these are either like craft or trade, um, and then even the ones that, that don't like harvest kind of just feels like crafting, but like vegetables, right? So um, it's mostly like making basic stuff, but it takes you a week. And even trading is mostly gold discounts, right? Gold discounts on stuff that you're trading for. So if you've got 100 gold pieces at level 5, a lot of these facilities are going to feel irrelevant. Even uh, the barracks and armory, which work together to create and arm um, defenders for your bastion, um, these are designed to address attacks, which are something that happens if you are away from your bastion, and it's one of the events um, that has a 5% chance of occurring. So when you're away from your bastion for longer than seven days, there's a 5% chance it gets attacked. The problem that many people have pointed out is the cost of these attacks is not great. There's a pretty strong odds that one of your special facilities gets shut down for a week. And if your defenders are wiped out, or if there were no defenders to, to start with, um, then it's going to shut down a second special facility for a week. So it's more like lose a turn. Um, and you actually have to dedicate, in order for this to work, you're probably dedicating your only two special facilities to defending against this. So it's, it's really not a good trade-off. So that's criticism number two for Bastions. I mean, imagine the potential of having a place that your, your players have like built up and care about and are invested in, um, and it gets like attacked and they, they need to, you know, engineer defenses for it and cooperate in like the defense of the the building and then this kind of reduces it to a couple d6 rolls um, that mostly have very little impact so that is a very underwhelming subsystem of bastions at level nine you'll unlock the gaming hall greenhouse laboratory um sac sacristy sacristy sac sacrist the the place it's on the screen you got it Scriptorum, stable, teleportation circle, theater, training area, and trophy room. My goodness, that's a lot of options. Um, so these are all way better, in my opinion, than the, the level five options. Like that, you're in. You should probably swap out whatever you got at level five for one of these options. You can do that once per level. You can swap out an old thing for a new thing. So just like get to it. What would I choose here? Well. Um, I really like the laboratory. There's a lot of flexibility and fun that you can have with the options provided, um, just because there's so many different things you can craft. Sacristy or the Scriptorum uh, are probably second. They, they have some potential as well um, for the creation of like lesser known items and, and more research as well. And then, you know, shout out to the gaming hall for being just like a source of passive income. That That's pretty nice for gold generation. If basic facilities mattered more, I think you'd probably lean towards this a little bit more. One thing I do have to say uh, right around this level, and it includes um, the library from level five, uh, is that I really like this opportunity to like make this a source of information. I, I really like, I lean into the Brennan Lee Mulligan school of campaign design, like, answer lots and lots of questions because you know the the hard part shouldn't be figuring out what's going on right it's an imagination based game you got to give them a lot of things to hook on to um, and the the judicious application of information is 
is so helpful in guiding the players, in crafting the story, in like making that come together. Um, and the ability for this library to be like, they proactively seek out information and then you can kind of like leverage that to guide them or to craft the story. Super, super fun and helpful. At level 13, you were looking at being able to do the archive, the meditation chamber, the menagerie, the observatory, the pub, and the reliquary, which are all super cool. Um, the Definitely the pub has got to be like close to the top of the list there just because you get this spy network that's so, so fun, um, as well as like like being a, a source of a bunch of other stuff. The, the stuff that's on tap is this nice little like utility, but it's just neat. It's a cool thing. And then the meditation chamber. I mean, I of the, of the buffs that you can get, of the mechanical combat things that these facilities can grant you, advantage on two saving throws of your choice is wild huge yeah those are the two i would build right away um at, at level 13. i i won't go through the the others that's sort of the meat of the of the system so like you can see that there's a huge variety of these facilities um and then they actually pack a punch like they make a really meaningful difference in your in your play in your gameplay just with the the kind of advantages that they provide you with informational and mechanical and just everything in between right um i think you could probably lean towards like a very strong like world building element or like world interaction with these um if you are growing a lot of food or like producing a lot of things th there's some op opportunity to like be a town and like a trade network i think that that's maybe on the slightly less realized side but that's okay because those options are there and if you if that's where you want to lean into you can the other thing i like is it's completely honest the the time window and the gold costs are numbers that can be pretty easily homebrewed. So in my campaign, it's like an, a very impoverished country setting. Um, the idea, you know, that there's, there's vampires in charge, and so they are both literally and metaphorically like bleeding the country dry of resources. And so it, it's very hard to get gold there. So all I did was I slashed the prices on everything by, by a, a decimal point, right? So 300 becomes 30, you know, 3000 becomes 300. Um, and, and that system is working fine. It, it works perfectly with the setting. You know, things are still hard to attain, but they, they are working towards like saving up for them. Um, and I honestly don't even think I'm going to change the gold yield of the guild hall uh, of the gaming hall, because, um, I think they should be rewarded for kind of like putting their energies towards investment. Um, I'm keeping the one week rule, but I can easily imagine a scenario in which uh, you would want to shorten this to a one day you know, turn for like maybe a campaign that takes place over the course of like a week or 10 days. And you want to fit a couple of Bastion turns in there. You can make that like a one day thing. Some of them like the workshop takes one week to craft a single shoe. So I think if you made, you know, there, there, you're going to have to like see what, how you feel about this, but there are some of these uh, facilities where if you shortened the Bastion turn to like one hour, if you had like a campaign that takes place over like 24 hours, I mean, the verisimilitude is mostly has to do with like setting up the room and like doing the construction, but, but like you could probably have one hour Bastion turns um, and not break a campaign if you're designed for a shorter time scale or a longer one. Like this is all, it, it's, these, these numbers scale pretty well. You can flex them up and down to meet your campaign where it needs to be. There's nowhere that it says that you can do that, but it's D&D, everyone's always gonna do that. So I actually do like that um, system. One thing that's left very ambiguous is whether this is intended to be a party system or an individual system. That is to say, do, does your entire party share one bastion or does everyone get their own bastions? And the reason I say this is because um, it does say that on your bastion turn, a character in their bastion can issue special orders to one or more of their bastion special facilities. So a single player can essentially run the entire bastion and there, it doesn't matter how big it is. It doesn't matter how many special facilities or anything. One player can run it. So you know, on one hand, there, there's no mechanical or any benefit whatsoever to like growing the party size um, with a bastion, right? The system doesn't accommodate that in any meaningful way. But if you have multiple bastions, like one of the things that, that we did as a trial in, in the campaign I'm running now is uh, each of the three players is getting their own bastion, right? This would be unwieldy with like eight players, but we've got three. So I figured, okay, you know, let's do this. 
And right at level five, they, you know, if they choose different special facilities for their bastion, they're going to get most of the facilities, right? They're, they're pretty much saturated on that. And yeah, it's true. Like as you go up in level, the number of facilities you add does not keep pace with the number of options. So they are going to, you know, eventually not have as many, but they'll have about half of the options. So, and you know, it, it's, it's kind of like, that's too much. Like having a, a bastion per player is too much. Um, but having one bastion for your party feels lame because it, it kind of feels like one person is going to kind of run that. Um, the only thing that it does better is some of those empowering things, right? Empower your party, which scales the number of people. So, you know, in that regard, some of these uh, effects, you, you, you would be upset if, um, if it was just you getting the, the benefit. At the same time, I don't think this is particularly interactive from a party perspective, and that's my criticism number three. It's a, this is a group game, it's a party game, it's, it's a game about friends coming together to do this thing, and the Bastion system seems to not be compatible with that sort of teamwork. So I would say that the end result is this kind of subsystem is it's definitely not fully baked. It's a little on the half-baked side, but it is rising with potential and it is bursting with flavor. Like there's so much cool stuff in here. Um, I think if they'd release this with like half the number of special facilities, I would feel way more negatively about it. But just seeing that there are lots of different options that people can choose and you know, you might run a bastion system like seven times and never have um, a, a overlap in special facilities that are added. I mean, that'll be pretty cool. What would I recommend to fix it? Because it's a UI playtest document, right? So they're asking for our feedback. Well, here's what I would do. To address number one, the number of special facilities in your, in your bastion should be constrained by the number of basic facilities. My justification here is your special facilities each come with a hireling, that's someone who actually runs the place. A laboratory is gonna have, have an alchemist or a scientist. You know, your armory are, is going to have a, a blacksmith or you know, a tradesman or something like that. And so each special facility has a person that actually does the work when you issue an order. And those people need kitchens, they need bathrooms, they need store closets, they need bedrooms. So, you know, if you don't have these basic facilities, you can't hire more hirelings to, to run more facilities. So, um, th I, this is kind of a very rough table for like how I would do basic facilities to special facilities. And uh, I'd like to incorporate the size in there as well, because um, there's really no incentive at all to increase the size of your basic facilities, even for flavor purposes. Um, so I think we definitely need that in there. So you're going to need to invest your time and your gold into building out those basic facilities so that your hirelings can just have normal lives while they are working for you. And I think that'd be a great addition and ties kind of the whole thing together. For number two, this is going to be a lot more complicated. Um, so obviously we're going to need to add some, some more features to the defensive system. I appreciate the simplicity of just having defenders who roll a d6 and if it's a one, they die. And if it isn't, they're fine. But, um, let's make it more interesting. I would add, um, I would add like a defensive feature to a lot more facilities. So essentially maybe if you have a laboratory, you get like a cauldron of acid that you can pour out on uh, on enemies, or if you have you know the the smithy, um, maybe the, the the armor is more resilient or something like that. So so let's add in a bunch of things to help you defend your bastion. Maybe these are even like one offs. Like like when you build the library, you get one vat of acid. You hope you don't have to use it in an assault, um, but maybe you do. And that vat of acid is um, going to be used to essentially like if a if a defender would have died instead you know the vat of acid gets poured on the assailant and that they die so so some sort of mechanical system to to play around with this combat mechanic so that when an assault happens you actually have the opportunity to like interact with that and like make decisions and like are we going to spend some resources instead of just sort of like finding out right that it that it happened the way that i would flavor this personally is like a retroactive battle strategy like if the enemies get to this point you know, deploy the vat of acid and then, um, you know, but in real time you're making that decision and then saying that that's, those are the instructions that you left with your people. I also think it'd be really fun to, to have a, a, you know, at, attack on the bastion happen while the players were inside. And then that mini system is going on maybe in real time with like a certain number of rounds. 
um, while they are facing off against like the big bad and their henchmen um, who've come from like a different angle. Uh, that would be a really cool system to implement. And then I think uh, with those all those uh, benefits, you're going to have to increase the danger and increase the damage. So change that attack chance from 5% to 20%. Seriously, like make it be a continuous threat that like if you leave your bastion undefended, it's going to be a bad time. And then the consequences of the attack need to be a, a little bit higher. So, you know, potentially, I think if, if all of your defenders are wiped out, so if you get to zero, I think that should actually, like, destroy a special facility. Um, and you're going to have to to rebuild that. So, uh, yeah, I think that the raising the stakes a little bit, raising the chance of attack, raising the, the amount of damage that's done, maybe they could even destroy basic facilities, right? And then, then that's like, oh, it's just going to take some time and some gold, but now I can't grow my bastion at all because those facilities have been damaged. So increase the stakes, increase the chance, and then also increase the defense, uh, increase the decision making behind it. I think it'd be really fun to find some application of each of these special facilities to the defense of the bastion. All right, lastly, um, number three. So uh, we need, I think, some system that scales with the number of players. So one player can run the bastion, but three players can run it better. So I think the way to do this is one order per player per turn. So instead of saying one player can issue orders to five facilities, that one player has got to issue an order to one, wait a week, one, or wait a week, one, wait a week. They can do it. It's fine. It, you just got to scale the amount of time. If you're doing like a solo play or something to that effect, um, maybe that's a rule that you can throw out. But I do think in a, in a party game, you want each person to be able to contribute. So now that second person is very consistently going to be useful because they're issuing an order to a second facility. And now the facilities you know, increase in number as you go up. I think the way to do this is there isn't a limit on the number of orders issued to a single facility. So if two players issue a craft order to the workshop, the workshop comes up with two things, right? We can flavor this as like the players are helping or, you know, they're placing all of their resources there or whatever, but like they can choose to use their facilities accordingly. And again, this is scaling with the number of players. So um, it's not like this unconstrained, crazy thing. It's just there are two people, so we're going to get twice the output. You know, that's all. To counterbalance that, I think that if a facility has not received an order in X number of days, it should inactivate, right, or, or like go to sleep. And then it's going to take a full bastion turn to like reawaken. So even though players can double down on whatever the best facility in the place is, it's going to cause all the other ones to, to sort of like wear away and reduce your flexibility and usefulness. So there's a little bit of an incentive to hop around with your orders. What did you guys think of the new Bastion system? Um, what did you think of my changes to it? I am hoping to keep getting videos out, but maybe a little bit less frequently than I used to. Um, for those of you who have any ideas for like future builds I could do, please let me know. I'm running thin on that list. Uh, and until next time, thanks for watching.